Okay, thank you very much for the invitation to speak here. It's a great honor to speak in this seminar. Um, today, I would like to talk about some recent progress about spectral theory on spherical conical metrics. So first of all, I should say that um, the motivation for me to study those problems were from differential geometry. So it was really during this process of um, trying to understand the singular uh, uniformization problem, which I'll, uh, which I'll discuss in a moment, that we realized that we have to understand the spectral properties. And then, um, so we made some progress and that's what I'm going to report today. However, um, there is still a lot of things unknown. So I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to speak here, to reach out to all the experts in spectral theory in the audience, um, to, um, to hopefully, and uh, I can, in the end, I can convince you that at least some of the problems are interesting and useful to study. And uh, hopefully that maybe some of the questions will be answered by using tools from spectral theory that I don't know. Okay, so my plan, uh, okay. Okay. My plan today is to um, first uh, talk about the differential geometry background, which is spherical conical metrics. Um, it's, uh, it was mentioned uh, last time by, by Yosef, but it's going to be a more general uh, spherical conical metric this time. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the analysis side, which is the self-adjoint extensions, because um, that's what, we're, what we use heavily in our work. And then, um, so that's analysis part. And then there is a more geometric or complex analysis part, which is met metrics with reducible monogamy. So I'll also spend some time to talk about that. And then in the end, I'll talk about the main theorem, which is relating the analysis and the geometry and to say that we, uh, we discover a, a spectral criterion of identifying the monogamy. Okay, so let me start by um, saying the, the, the uh, motivation of this problem, which is uniformization. So the classical uniformization theorem is saying that for, um, for any fixed conformal class, there is unique existence of smooth constant curvature metrics. So, and by Gauss-Bonnet, the curvature is determined by the, by the Euler characteristic of, so first of all, um, everything is just on surface, uh, orientable surfaces. So, and uh, so the, uh, here by Gauss-Bonnet, we know that the curvature is completely determined by the Euler characteristic of the surface. And this is, uh, this is a Gauss-Bonnet formula. Now today, okay, today uh, what I'm going to talk about is um, instead of doing smooth metrics, we want to add in conical singularities. So one reason why we care about, well, I'll talk about more motivation why we care about this, uh, but in general, the idea is that those singularities are marked points, so this gives you more information. Okay, so the basic object here today is the constant curvature matrix with conical singularities. So it's a smooth metric most of the places except at a, uh, at a few marked points where near those points you have singularities and it's asymptotic to a cone with angle two pi beta j. And here, the uh, using this um, using this using this um, two pi beta j, we can see that the again we have a modified Gauss-Bonnet formula, which is here that. Uh, um, so again, if you put all the beta j to be equal to one, then this is angle two pi. So there are just it's smooth point, no conical singularities. So this goes back to the original Gauss-Bonnet. On the other hand, if beta j is not equal to one, that means that if you have a true singularity there, then it modifies the curvature. So here, this is a Gauss-Bonnet formula here, and it tells us that if the angle is bigger than two pi, then this increases the curvature. On the other hand, if the angle is less than two pi, this decreases the curvature. And moreover, what we're seeing here is that if I'm given a, um, clo a an orientable surface with given genus, and I'm given a set of betas, then there is only one curvature sign that would work. So I'm fixed, uh, there's, a, there's no choice for me to, to see which kind of constant curvature I'm looking for. Okay, now um, let me first uh, talk about what, what, what does this mean to, have, to be asymptotic to a cone? So it's really, um, for a surface, it's really very easy to see. Uh, it's basically a differential geometry exercise that you can write it in, ge in geodesic polar coordinates that near a cone point, it's very explicit what this uh, metric looks like. So here I've written out um, the first way, uh, I've written out um, in the three cases where you have different curvature, what it looks like. 
So again, if you remember that if I set my beta to be equal to one, then that means that uh, there's no component, so that's a smooth point. Then this, this three expressions here just goes back to the regular Euclidean, dr squared plus r squared d theta squared, or spherical or hyperbolic coordinates in, in, in smooth points. On the other hand, if beta is not equal to one, then this becomes a, a, a parameter here, and you can see that it does create a cone point. Now, um, today, what I'm going to focus on is the k equal to one case. And here, this, in this case, we call it spherical. So here, when I say spherical, it doesn't mean that the underlying surface is a sphere. As we, can, as we see from the gauss bonnet formula here, even if I have a very high genus, um, but as long as I put my betas to be very big, this, um, I can still achieve uh, positive curvature. So here, spherical just means that the curvature is positive one. And um, another thing I should also point out that, uh, um, so here beta j is just any real number. It doesn't need to be an integer. Okay. And um, another thing I want to mention here is that uh, um, you can write it in another way, which is using conformal coordinates. So this will be useful because later I'm going to use this as my, in my expansion, that um, using this change of variable, say, say so z equal to beta r or beta e to the i theta, and you, if you put it into the k equal to zero to the flat case here, you'll see that uh, this metric g is exactly written as mod z to the two times beta minus one d mod dz squared. In, uh, in other words, what they're saying is that uh, in this case, this metric can be written as a usual isothermal coordinates, smooth one, times a singular conformal co factor, which is mod z to the two times beta minus one. Now you might want to ask, so what's happening to a spherical and hyperbolic case? Well, in this case, it, using a similar co conformal coordinate transformation, you'll see that G is again has this format where FZ is a very nice function, has a very nice expansion, and start doing, starting with uh, leading, order, leading term one. So it just, uh, again, the, all the singular terms are, are concentrated in this mod Z to the two times beta minus one which of course makes sense if we, well, when beta is equal to one, there's no singular terms. On the other hand, if beta is not equal to one, this is where singularities are concentrated. Okay, so this is uh, my basic object that I wanna study. Now let me uh, first give you a few examples. So, well, for, um, so first of all, there, the, the easiest example to give is uh, this translation surfaces which is um, you take a piece of uh, Euclidean surface and which is bounded by a few pairs of straight lines and you try to glue them using this color-coded uh, identification. And for example, for this one here, you can see that, uh, well, you can try it yourself using a piece of paper, which will give you um, a, a flat surface, which is um, genus two and with, a, with an angle six pi in it. Okay, so that's, um, that's the first, and translation surfaces are all flat surfaces with conical singularities. However, all the cone angles are integer of two pi. Now, the second example I can give is this branch cover. So for this way, in this way, you can get a lot of different, um, different curvatures. So basically all curvatures you can, well, you can get all curvatures. So that is you start with a smooth surface, uh, can be a sphere, a smooth surface with constant curvature. So it can be a sphere, can be a flat torus, can be a hyperbolic surface, and then take the branch cover of that, and then pull back the metric to this branch cover. Now, what this get us is that um, we have conical singularities at those branching points. Again, all those branching, uh, all those cone angles will be integer of two pi because it's a branch cover. So it's completely determined by the branch ind indices. And uh, the, third one, which is more interesting, which is called a spherical football. So this is, um, a, this is an American football that it's um, obtained by taking a sphere, cut, taking the North Pole and the South Pole and take two meridians. And then you take out the piece that's bounded by this meridian and then glue the two sides together. And this way you get a topological sphere, but with two cone and conical singularities, which of them is angle beta. And those, those, so this means that the two conical, conical points has to be the same angle. However, this beta doesn't need to be less than two pi. For example, you can glue a lot of them pieced together, just wrap them around and then glue them in the end, you'll get any, any large cone angle. One thing that's special about the spherical football is that if beta is not an integer of two pi, then there, 
is only one way to do it in the sense that the two cone points are rigid, that they have to be in the North Pole and South Pole, that all the geodesics connecting the two points have to be equal lengths, and you cannot perturb the North Pole or South Pole way. And this rigidity comes out later, and which also makes the spherical football a very interesting example to study. Okay, so that's um, the third example. Now, starting from the spherical football, we can generate more examples. So the next example I want to talk about is so-called a heart. So this heart is um, obtained by gluing two footballs together. So this is, you just take two spherical footballs, doesn't need to be same angle, you can, one is angle alpha, the other, the other is angle beta, and then you cut a slit in the middle between, uh, for, for each of the footballs, start, say, both from, uh, starting from the, the south pole, and then you glue them. In this way, what you get is, again, topologically a sphere, but this time has four conical singularities. So this is also a very interesting example that will show up later. Now, of course, one can do a lot. For example, you can take a bunch of footballs and do this bouquet of footballs, or you can also do another kind of gluing, which means that you just cut in a slit in the middle and then, and then glue them. So we can see that there are a lot of freedom for, for doing this. Okay, so those are a few examples. So I should say that uh, in terms of, uh, um, in terms of difficulty of analysis, um, I, I, I purposefully uh, rank them so, so that um, the, the, more, the later those examples appear, the, it's more difficult to understand in terms of analysis or perturbation. Okay, now, um, so hopefully I convinced you that there are a lot of spherical conical metrics. Now the next question you might want to ask is, uh, well, why do we care about them? So in, in, in the differential geometry world, the study of constant curvature conical metrics have um, attracted a lot of attention recently. And uh, there's a reason for that. So part of the reason is that um, it's, it's related to a lot of other things. So first of all, um, this, if we're talking about hyperbolic conical metrics, then it's a bridge between two classical Riemann moduli spaces. One is the one without, um, without marked points. So that is, if you put all the cone angles to two pi, then that's, that's just the smooth Riemann surfaces. On the other hand, if you push all the cone angles towards zero, then what this gets you is Riemann surfaces with, uh, with cusp singularities, which is a pointed moduli spaces. So this, uh, those conical metrics can be seen as uh, the bridge between two kinds of Riemann uh, surfaces, and uh, they, they serve as a bridge. And the um, next, um, in, the next reason why it's interesting is that uh, it turns out that it's in physics there is some there is uh, an important model called magnetic vortices in gauge theory that um, so those are solitons of gauge sigma models and it turns out that the equation governing the magnetic vortices can be completely transfer, uh, transposed to, uh, trans transformed into um, the Liouville equation that's governing this, the constant curvature conical matrix. And in fact, the conical singularities just correspond to where the singularities of vortices are. So, so basically starting the two things are the same. And then the third reason is that there is a large class of PDE called mean field equations. And so this constant curvature matrix uh, equation is one of them. And then there's also a, a higher dimensional system. There is a multi-dimensional version, which is called TODA system. So again, this is a, so if you view this conical metric as one function governing it, which I'll explain why it's just one function. Um, then if you, uh, if you stack a few functions together, this gets you a TODA system, which is also a very, very interesting system to study. And then another uh, motivation for, for studying this for us is that there is a higher dimensional analog. So recently there has been a lot of development in, the, in this Keller-Einstein world um, with conical singularities. So it turns out that conical singularities, when you open the cone up to 2 pi, that's um, one of the important tools to studying this conical Einstein metrics. And basically nobody knows what's happening when you're opening up the cone more. So this, um, therefore, we are hoping that this, uh, this lower dimensional version would give us some analysis tool to study the higher dimensional one. 
And then, of course, this constant curvature, conical matrix, once you have constant curvature, it can, it's related to a lot of other things, say representation varieties, Higgs bundles, uh, constant mean curvature surfaces in hyperbolic three spaces. So there are a lot of things that you can transform from the constant curvature conical matrix, which is why that people are interested to see if we can get uh, uh, more understanding of this. And another, uh, you can say, interesting uh, a uh, fact about the subject is that it can be approached in many ways. So the main, uh, our main way to study this is using PDE, which is a singular Lua equations, which is where the spectral zero will come in. Now, on the other hand, there has also been a lot of progress in using complex analysis, which is using developing maps and Schwarzen derivatives that I'm going to mention that um, when we talk about monogamy and also cut and glue using, just using synthetic geometry. So it turns out that uh, we're, uh, we may some understanding of how the PD is connected to the other two uh, two approaches, and to see that see that um, there are there are some results you can obtain from both ways, and uh, that's that also in return uh, tells us something about the uh, the operator itself. Okay, so that's hopefully I convince. Uh, I hopefully I at least provide some motivation of why we study this. Now let me. Um, set the, the main problem we're interested in. So the main problem is uh, that uh, this following singular uniformization problem. That is, if I'm given a bunch of data satisfying the gauss bonnet condition, which gives me the, um, which tells me which curvature sign I should look for, then does there exist a unique constant curvature conical metric? So here, um, when I say the conical data, this means a given Riemann surface. Um, if it's not a sphere, it also means that uh, you need to uh, fix the conformal structure on the Riemann surface, the smooth one. And then P is on the, the um, point the, where the cone points should be. And beta is a vector that tells me at those cone points what kind of cone angles they should be. Okay, so those are the data that's, uh, that's given. Then the question is, can I find a uniformization of that? Now, it turns out that this question is sometimes hard, sometimes easy. The, in the easy case, or in the hyperbolic and flat case, it's easy that uh, one can use um, basically maximum principle to see that, that uh, yes, as long as uh, uh, this, this data satisfies the gauss bonnet condition, there is a unique constant curvature conical metric up, well, up to scaling for the, hyper, uh, for the flat one. On the other hand, for the spherical case, the existence and uniqueness are not always true, and then there are all kinds of evidences. So, and so far, uh, and uh, as you can see that um, this, this field started um, about 30 years ago and uh, has, been, uh, has been attracting attention recently in, in the past five years or so, that um, people are, we're, uh, we are gathering evidence that, and unfortunately the whole picture is still not very clear. So the short answer is that uh, there is not always existence. Depend, there are constraints on the data. We don't know all constraints about the data yet. There's not always uniqueness, and most of the time it's not unique. However, we don't know the, uh, we don't know much about the, uh, the solution counting, and we don't even know whether the number of solutions would be finite at this point. Okay, so as you can see that in the spherical case, there are a lot of things that are known. Now, let me say what we are approaching it, how we are approaching it. So we want to understand it through a PDE. So if we are thinking about spherical conical metrics, then um, here I'm going to view this as a solution to uh, the following PDE, which is written here. So this is Liouville equation. Now, the idea is that I'm going to fix a, a, a model metric on the surface, and then I'm going to use a conformal factor e to the 2u to, uh, to modify this model metric so that I get the correct constant curvature conical metric. Um, on the other hand, in order to modify it so that I get the correct constant curvature, this, this conformal factor U has to satisfy the equation here, which is that, so this is a conformal, uh, the curvature under conformal transformation. Now, there are two ways to, the, to the, do this. Either I can use a model metric which is smooth, so you, this uh, metric doesn't see any conical singularities, then, well, my U has to have to have to have singularities, and uh, which which makes this equation uh, has a which has a smooth 
uh, operator here because Laplacian of G0 is a smooth operator. However, you would have fixed singularities or you can view it as a fixed boundary conditions on those punctures. On the other hand, what I can do is I can use a G0, which is not necessarily constant curvature, but it should have already the correct conical singularity at those points. Then you can be a bounded solution. Then, of course, the price to pay is that this Laplacian G0 would be a singular operator. It will have a conical singularity already contained in it. So today, what we're, our approach is going to be the second one. So that is, I'm already going to give a G0 that's, um, that has conical singularities, and which is also why I'm going to talk about the analysis later that it involves understanding uh, the, the, the spectral theory of a singular operator which has conical singularities. Okay, so that's our approach. And as you can see that uh, basically the, um, the geometric question of whether there exists unique constant curvature conical metrics becomes the question of whether we can find a unique solution to this singular Liouville equation with the correct boundary conditions. Okay, now, so this equation itself is a nonlinear equation. Now, now let me go back backtrack a little bit. We're going to talk about the linearized operator because well, most of the things I'm going to talk about today is perturbation. So one needs to understand the linearized operator first. In this case, you can see that the linearized operator is given by Laplace in G minus two. Okay, so this is the, the, the first appearance of number two and this is going to appear through the, until the end of the talk. That um, as usual that for a nonlinear equation, if I have a kernel for the linearized operator, then this creates problem in the nonlinear problem. That uh, that's an, is, it gives us a problem in, in terms of iteration and it gives us abstraction of finding solutions. And in general, this means that uh, if you have a kernel of the linearized operator, then this creates singularities in the moduli space. And in fact, you see that, uh, we, we see that in some special examples, for example, the spherical football, it is indeed a singularity in the moduli space. That in the sense that the moduli space at this point is not smooth, that you cannot find a smooth neighborhood nearby that you can just perturb it uh, smoothly with conical data. And so this is a, in the, the general idea that I have a linearized operator, if I have a kernel, I have a problem. However, I have to identify where the problems are and the, the best is if we can understand what the kernels are. So, so that's, um, the, um, that's the motivation of studying this Laplace in G minus two. And we made some progress um, in understanding how we, can, how we can deal with this problem. So this is um, the differential geometry results that I, um, I um, completed with Rafe Mathieu during the past uh, few years that we, we, um, we, made, we made some understanding of how to get rid of a singularity or how to, how to understand the singularity. So the idea, uh, I'll, I won't mention it too much here because it's not too related to the spectral theory, but at least I, should, I want to say that um, this is where the motivation is. So the idea is that we can desingularize it by adding a, uh, action of splitting cone points, which will give us a nonlinear model to understand this problem. And the important thing is that the dimension of the eigenspace for the Laplace in G minus two really determines the local behavior of the moduli space. That if you don't have and you don't have any eigenspace, then it's a free deformation, meaning that you have a smooth, very nice neighborhood. If you have some dimension, then the, uh, there's partial rigidity in terms of deformation. On the other hand, if you reach the maximum dimension, then there's complete rigidity. Okay, so that's the reason why we want to understand what's the dimension of the eigenspace, for example, and where they are. And moreover, we also obtained a, a pairing formula, which tells us that the local deformation is completely determined by the expansion of the eigenfunction with eigenvalue two there. So if we know what those eigenfunctions are, basically we know how you can deform those singularities. Okay, now, so this is why we want to understand which metrics have non-trivial kernel for this for this different for this linearized operator because that's where that's where problems are and uh, moreover um, uh, moreover there's also um, we also want to understand the expansion of the eigenfunction because the expansion of the eigenfunction will tell us how you can deform it okay so that's why we want to understand this all right now but as I mentioned before, this Laplacian G is a, um, 
this G is a conical metric. So this Laplacian is a singular operator. So there's some, some, some work we need to do before we can talk about spectrum. So as I, uh, well, I, I think as everybody here knows that Laplacian for a complete manifold will be an L2 self-adjoint operator automatically. However, on an incomplete manifold, we'll need to specify boundary conditions. So here I have a conical singularities, which is unfortunately an incomplete manifold. So we have to do boundary conditions before I can talk about self-adjointness and therefore a uh, spectrum. So the, uh, the von Neumann theory tells us that uh, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence of self-adjoint extension of operator with Lagrangian sub subspace of boundary conditions. So for example, uh, if I'm thinking about this d squared over dx squared on zero one, then different boundary conditions will give me different self-adjoint extensions and this will give me different uh, spectrum and different eigenfunctions. So the same idea applies here that I'll need to talk about the, the, um, the boundary conditions. So of course we might already starting to think that we all have one classical self-adjoint extension there. Indeed, there is one that now we're going to talk about. But in, in our case, I should say that there's another one that's also interesting. Okay, all right. But before that, let me uh, say a little bit about the local expansion so that I can just directly talk about which boundary conditions I'm going to choose. So in our case, well, as I said, that this operator is just Laplace in G minus two, where G is a spherical conical metric. And as I mentioned before, that in terms of local coordinates, I can just write this G using this, uh, using a polar geodesic coordinates. So this dr squared plus beta squared sine r squared d theta squared. And then you can compute the Laplacian completely. You just write that like that. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to write it in this way, which, is, which makes my life slightly easier. That is, I'm going to write it in the, um, taking out this r to the minus two, and then write at r dr squared and beta squared because of the homogeneity here. So I should say that um, there is, in terms of in microlocal analysis, there, um, this type of operator has been studied a lot and it's called a conical operator. And uh, it's basically, uh, and there's a, another type of operator called B operator. And that's basically, um, if you take out this R to the minus two, this part is called a B operator. So there are a lot of general theory about how to deal with those conical operators that I'm not going to talk about, but I'm going to use. And another thing I want to mention here is that if you compare this homogeneity here, say if you apply to an R to the alpha term, you see that uh, this eigenvalue two is a lower order term compared to this R to the minus two R dr square. Okay, so in terms of the, the, which is also why in terms of local expansion later, you will see that this two doesn't appear in the low, doesn't, doesn't change the choice of boundary conditions, doesn't, doesn't affect the local expansion, but it does affect the global behavior. Now, as I said, that uh, there are a lot of things related to studying those general conical singularities and general conical operators. So for mapping properties, for example, it started with Chigar's work and then has been, um, and then and has, there are a lot of generalizations on uh, different, uh, on more general uh, B operators, conical operators, and, and so. And in terms of the self-adjoint extension uh, that I'm going to talk about, Today, there is a work by Gil Craner and Mendoza, that's um, what I'm going to use. And uh, then there's spectral geometry on flat conical surfaces. So one of the uh, motivations for us to, to consider the two types of extension here is a work uh, by Ilaret that um, where, we, we, where the, those two types of extensions were first uh, given and we are going to apply it to spherical conical surfaces. And then there are more general work in terms of the determinable Laplacians for conical surfaces. So again, there are a lot of work in this field. And um, so here is certainly, it's not, a, it's not a complete list of literature. And um, please let me know if there's anything I'm missing as I'm, I'm very happy to learn more about the spectral geometry side of, this, uh, uh, of, the, sphere, of the conical surfaces. And then, um, if we talk about the scattering theory of a conical manifold, then there is a long history starting from 20 years ago that's and it's still going on. Okay, so that's, uh, there are a lot of analysis now. To, uh, so here I'm going to apply it to directly to this particular conical surfaces. So there's a little bit of um, so technical definition here, which is what type of domain I'm going to choose. So first of all, um, in general for 
for such a single operator, there is a minimal domain, which is just using the closure of uh, of compact uh, of of um, of CC infinity on functions on puncture surfaces with respect to the graph norm, and the, the maximal domain is this auto dual. But the point is that self-adjoint extensions are mid-dimensional surfaces in between. And because those two D, the, the minimal domain and the maximal domain, they're not the same. So we have choices in between. So now I'm not going to do too much about the general theory, but the idea is that locally, we can do the expansion very explicitly. The simplest case, if I just have a operator that's, uh, I just have a point that has a conical singularity, but that's uh, less than two pi, then the maximal, and the minimal, the, the difference between the maximal and minimal is just those two numbers, a0 plus b0 log r. Okay, meaning that uh, if, it's a, if it's in the minimum domain, that it's just a sum function that's very nice. On the other hand, if it's a maximal domain, then you might have some singularities, which has a log. And on the other hand, as you can see that, well, that um, self-adjoint extensions are based on the phenomenon theory that it's corresponds to the Lagrangians in the choice of a, space, uh, the, the parameters a0, b0. So here, this means that uh, it's just, uh, it's completely determined by an S2, which means that you have a lot of self-adjoint extensions. In fact, uh, all self-adjoint extensions are forms a, a sphere. Now, the next one I wanna talk about, which is more interesting, which is that uh, if I have a cone angle that's bigger than two pi, but say still less than four pi, then in this case, what happens is that uh, the difference between minimum and maximum uh, domain will have a bunch of different parameters, which I'm just writing out here. So for this one, actually, you can just write out the, the, um, the conical operator and just write it uh, explicitly. And uh, you can see that besides this constant a0 plus this uh, log r term, there are also r to the 1 over beta terms and r to the minus 1 over beta terms. Okay, and uh, um, so I have a bit more freedom. In fact, I have six numbers to choose from. So I have six numbers between, uh, uh, in, in, so it's C6 and I need to find a Lagrangian in between. And now the point is that we're only going to consider two of them. Okay, now, so again, when I talked about self-adjoint extensions, your first reaction would be, we know there's one that's most of people care about, which is the bounded extension or the Friedrichs extension. So that's basically I, uh, most of the uh, works about um, the self-adjoint extension in conical surfaces are about this case. And indeed, that's the case we care about most. So that is the bounded extension, which means that, uh, well, if I look at this expansion here, I have to knock out all those unbounded terms. So for example, this log r term is not bounded, so it has to go. And this r to the minus one over beta, those two terms have to go. And that's the, so Friedrich's extension means that I knock out three terms and all those terms are unbounded. Okay, so that, that's the first extension and that's the one that we usually care about. Now, it turns out that there's another extension called holomorphic extension that's also interesting. At least it's related to this, the problem we're studying. So that is taking the holomorphic half of the coefficients. It's not very easy to see why it means holomorphic, but the idea is that if you take the conformal transformation, uh, the conformal coordinates transformation I mentioned in the beginning, then this r to the one over beta e to the i theta is like z, and this r to the one over beta e to the minus i theta is like z bar, and then the, the, this b1 term is like one over z, and the b minus one term is like one over z bar. And again, the idea is that I'm going to knock out all those things that's related to z bar, like that. So this is the second holomorphic, the second extension. And then this gives a different domain. So as we all know that if you choose different domain, you'll have different spectrum behavior. So first of all, well, as we saw earlier that if all the cone angles are less than two pi, I don't have those a1, b1, a minus one, b minus one. So there, the two extensions are equal. So there's no problem in the sense that uh, when we talk about the small angle spherical conical metrics, there is no question about which domain to choose. There's only one domain to choose. There's only one domain that's useful and that's just a Friedrich's extension. On the other hand, that when, when some of the cone angles are big, the, you can see that, well, you, there, there are differences. 
And uh, uh, one interesting result from, is from ELRAT that uh, on translation surfaces, so that's flat surfaces, then there is Dirichlet to Neumann isospectrality. He, he discovered that for the Friedrich extension and holomorphic extension, in this case, the, the spectrum are the same. Now, before I talk about our results, so our results is not, well, we, we don't know whether the spectrum are the same, spectrum are the same. most likely they are not, but we related some of that. Uh, but uh, we, re we, we mostly focus on a special class of metrics called uh, reducible metrics. So first of all, I should say that reducible metrics are defined using this developing map, which is um, what I'm going to talk about now. But the idea is that those metrics are very special. They are all in the singularity of the moduli space. So they are uh, a model singular, singular metric to study. So the classical way to, under, to define the monogamy is the following, that we use the so-called developing map, which is, so if I look at the spherical conical metric on the left-hand side, so this is a football, for example, then I start at a point, uh, that's, I start at a point that's away from the, the uh, away from the, um, the, the conical singularity. So then this point has, will have a smooth neighborhood. And I know that if I just look at locally, it's really just a piece of sphere. So I can identify it with a piece of sphere on the right. So the right-hand side is just a standard sphere. Now, if I take a curve on the left-hand side and I started patching things up, so, if I, so that means that I take a piece of sphere here, then I take a next piece of sphere that's, that's overlapping with this one here. Then again, because it's a, it's a smooth neighborhood, I can extend it in the same way as in, on the right-hand side on, on, the, on the standard sphere. So I can just keep going and I'll keep traveling. So on the, on the left-hand side, I have those bubbles that's traveling on the singular surface. On the right-hand side, I have bubbles traveling on the standard surface, on the standard sphere. Now, of course, I can complete the loop when I complete a loop on the left-hand side, I'm going to overlap with my original point. On the other hand, on the right-hand side, well, it's not the same surface. So when I, after I complete a loop on the right-hand side, what I see is that I end up somewhere else on, on the surface. So you can see that, um, and there is a transformation related to that, and that's a monogamy. So the, Stand, the formal definition is that uh, one can one can develop. Um, there exists a multi-valued meromorphic map, which is on a punctured surface to the sphere, where I identified with uh, with a C bar, which is called a developing map, such that uh, it's using this F, which is this developing map. You can pull back the metric to from the standard spherical metric, and this will give me the spherical conical metric on the left hand side. And the monogamy of F is contained in PSU2 because I'm on a sphere. And uh, the cone angles, well, indeed, the, that's where um, the principal singular term of the Schwarzen derivative of F is given by this term here, which will determine that near a singular point, that's indeed what the, what, uh, when you pull back the metric, that's what the singularity would appear. Okay, so that's the standard definition, but the idea is that there exists such a map but it, it might be multi-valued, and most of the time it is multi-valued. Okay, so this is a, um, the developing map, and uh, the, so we can talk about monogamy. So the monogamy of developing maps of the same metric, they are, well, you, you can choose different, mm, by choosing different developing maps, you'll get different monogamy. However, they are all in the same conjugacy class of, in PSU2. And then there is a special class called reducible metrics which is that uh, if I have a monogamy in U1, so that's a subgroup. So this is defined um, earlier in the work by Umihara and Yamada and later developed by Chen Wang Wuxu, that uh, um, they show that this reducible metric are really special. So as I mentioned before, that uh, there are special classes that I, I drew earlier. So for example, the branch cover. The branch cover is a reducible metric that uh, so for example, this double metric, well, if you consider the, the, and in this case, it's super special in the sense that the monogamy is just the one point. That the monogamy, it's, it's trivially reducible in the sense that there, the monogamy is just, it just contains identity. And on the other hand, for the spherical football and those ones that are, uh, that are glued from spherical footballs in the correct way, you can get more non-trivial reducible metrics. 
And in short, uh, in short what this, this reducible means is that uh, there is a special direction. It's not a really a symmetric direction, but you can see that, you can say that uh, this metric would have some special properties along the special direction. And that's where this reducible comes from. Okay, so the second thing I want to mention is that uh, while this reducible monogamy itself has a lot of interesting things relating to other fields. So for example, this metric is associated to a meromorphic one form. So this is, I, so this is a meromorphic one differential that's um, special in the sense that it generates the developing map. And uh, you can calculate this for each, each uh, reducible metric. And this gives a horizontal and vertical foliation and gives a ribbon graph. And so there are a lot of things that's related to this holomorphic meromorphic differential world. And um, another thing that's special is that each reducible metric, at least on S2, it corresponds to a half infinite, half infinite translation surface. And by this identification, uh, Iramanka showed that there are plenty of reducible metrics and all of them are special in the sense that uh, we can see that any reducible metric has a non-compact family of conformal dilations, which makes it non-unique and also makes it, uh, on the other hand, by duality, also makes it rigid in other ways. So in fact, uh, I showed recently that such metrics have deformation rigidity. So those ones are bad in the sense that if we look for smoothness in moduli spaces, those ones are our enemies. Uh, they are not the only enemies, enemies it turns out, but they are, they are easy enemies to attack here. Okay, so our, uh, the first, the, the, well, the first part of our main theorem is that uh, we can identify those reducible monogamy by using the spectral properties. So we showed that uh, a spherical conical metric G have reducible monogamy if and only if two is in the joint spectrum of the holomorphic Laplacian and the Friedrich's Laplacian. And uh, I should also mention that um, another, uh, another equivalent, um, def equivalent statement is that uh, this is if and only if there is a real valued eigenfunction in the Friedrich's uh, domain. So that is, as long as this, uh, we can find an eigenfunction in Friedrich's domain that's real valued, that's fine. And that one, it will be automatically in the holomorphic extension already. Okay, so, well, let me first mention that one direction that's easy. That is, if you have a, a reducible metric, then there is a good developing map, which has uh, this U1 monogamy. And then we can just directly generate such an eigenfunction. You can just write it all like that. And, uh, um, in this case, because this f has u1 monogamy, meaning that uh, this mod f square is well defined, so we don't have a multi-valued, uh, we don't have a, a an EO-defined function here, which is uh, and then therefore, and this phi can actually be extended to a whole surface that can be can be extended across the uh, the, the the singular the the singularities. So this one, and we can show that this one is indeed satisfying Laplacian G applying the phi is, in two, is equal to two phi, and it's also in the joint domain of both holomorphic extension and Friedrich extension. Now, you might want to ask, okay, so we have a, just have an identification here. Now, what happens to the other direction? It seems like I can just uh, using, if I have such an eigenfunction, I can just uh, reproduce the, the, the developing map and we're done. Unfortunately here, it's not so easy. The idea is that uh, well, I only have mod f. So there is the argument of f is unknown. And moreover, this f is, uh, is potentially multivalued. So there are a lot of things that you just, uh, it's, not, it's not completely fixed. So we cannot just use this eigenfunction to get it out. So the other direction is actually non-trivial, which I'm going to explain. But before that, let me uh, mention two special examples that I, I, saw, I talked about earlier and see how we, um, how we consider, um, how we relate um, this eigenfunction to back to the monogamy. So the idea is that uh, the eigenfunction, for example, for the spherical football here, um, the eigen, if I take the coordinate Z that's centered on the North Pole, then the eigenfunction is just given by this format here. And then you can compute its gradient vector field and it's, it's gener it, the, the, this vector field that's generated is very special. This minus z partial z. If you look at uh, how what it does on this um, on this uh, football, what it does is that it has this conformal dilation. 
So that is, you just fix the North Pole and the South Pole and pulling everything towards the, the uh, sorry, away from the North Pole, just pulling everything, peeling it towards the South Pole. So this is a, uh, on the other, well, this is, by the way, this is just the, the, the same type of conformal uh, dilation that generates this non-compact family of uh, spherical conical metrics. So as you can see that this eigenfunction itself is doing something very interesting to the geometry that uh, it generates this gradient vector field. And similarly, I can talk about branch covers. Now, for branch covers, um, if I do, so, so just the simple double cover. So here, my picture is not very accurate in the sense that if I'm just uh, taking the standard double cover f equals to z squared, those two points of four pi there, they really should be antipodal. Okay, so that's just the, 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 the best double cover you can think of. Then in this case, I can again compute everything explicitly that, uh, uh, that we can, we will see that there are three two eigenfunctions. They are all from the pulling back of the sphere where on the sphere we have three eigenfunctions with eigenvalue two. So you pull them back and then this is, those, those are the, the, the three numbers here. Okay, the three functions here. And you can see that on, well, in this case, everything is again well-defined. And then the corresponding gradient vector fields, as you can see that they are all meromorphic. And the first one is a, this conformal dilation vector field. And the other two are meromorphic and they're also doing something similar. Okay, so as you can see that uh, they, one thing that we discovered is that uh, those eigenfunctions are doing something interesting about with the vector field. So we want to attack it from that point of view later. Now, but before that, let me talk about this number two again. So you can see that um, for this whole, for my whole talk today, I'm uh, mostly just fighting with this number two. So this, um, I want to make another, a few more uh, connections to, to other places. So again, well, why number two here? Why, why do I just want to focus on number two? Well, here, first of all, this Laplacian minus two is a linearized operator. So that's, uh, that just comes from the equation. And uh, the secondly, this, uh, this two appears to be the first non-zero eigenvalue of the standard sphere. And again, this is two appears in this eigenvalue as a parametric problem, which was, um, which was mentioned, given, talked about by, uh, by Joseph last, last week, which uh, in this case, well, at least in the, in the, in the simple case that uh, on, a genus two, in a, on a genus zero surface, two is the upper bound of the first uh, eigenvalue and two is only achieved by the sphere. And there's another side, which is if you bring in the Keller structure. So that is if we have compact structure here already, well, on, on, the, on, on this, um, in my Riemann surface case, I do have that. If a smooth manifold is Keller, then there is a Lishnerowitz type R estimate tells us that if you have a lower bound of Ricci curvature, then you have a lower bound of the first eigenvalue. And uh, in fact, here, and um, I think it's Obata that uh, uh, proved that um, if n is equal to, if my dimension is equal to two, so it's a two-dimensional Keller, real two-dimensional Keller uh, manifold, then the equality here is only achieved by the sphere. So that's another type of um, inequality here, but the two again appears naturally. So for example, here, if I put my Ricci to be bounded below by one, then the first eigenvalue is bounded below by two. So again, that's two. Okay. Now, we're mostly going to focus on this Lishnerowitz type argument in the sense that we really want to bound everything away from two. However, it doesn't always work. It works in some cases. It works in this more angle case that this Lishnerowitz type argument still works on the spherical conical metrics if all the cone angles are less than two pi. So that is, um, if you look at the solution with type argument, again, I'm just going to replace mu equal to one. So here it's really rich equal to one. Then can I get lambda one greater than or equal to two? So the answer is yes. If you assume all the cone angles are less than two pi, then by result by Luo Tian and also uh, re, uh, reproved recently by Matsun Weiss that uh, you can still get the, the lower bound of the first eigenvalue. In this case, it's still lower uh, bounded by two, and moreover, it equals to two if and only if g is a football. So the here, of course, uh, I'm assuming all the cone angles are less than two pi, so this football just has smaller cone angles. But, and the idea is that uh, using the same type of argument as this Lishnerowitz type argument, integration by part, 
we use Buckner's identity first by relating a, a complex gradient vector field, which is generated by um, the, 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 the eigenfunction. And then you have this type of argument, you have this type of identity because the X is generated by the eigenfunction here. Then you apply integration by part and by using the lower bound and then using the fact that you can integration by part, then you'll get that uh, this left-hand side has to be zero and you get a holomorphic vector field. And if it's, if it's a cone, if all the cone angles are less than two pi, you also see that this vector field has to vanish at all the cone points. Then you see that there aren't so many choices. Unfortunately, this argument only works if all the cone angles are less than two pi if, if we're in the Friedrichs domain. That. So you'll see that when the cone angles are bigger, the, in the expansion of the Friedrichs domain, you'll see that there are more and more singular terms appearing. So when I talk about this, this gradient vector field, when the cone angles are bigger and bigger, there are more and more singular terms. So once the, once the angle cross two pi, you see that uh, this term cannot be, this left-hand side cannot be integrated anymore. That this integration by part argument just cannot work anymore. And in fact, there is a reason that it shouldn't work because this, this lower bound does not hold for this Friedrichs extension. And, but I just want to mention that uh, that's, um, that's one of the starting points that why we want to consider a different extension. But the idea is that uh, in this case, once you have bigger than two pi cone angles, it doesn't work. We do not have this eigenvalue lower bound, which is one reason to explain that why there are so many weird things happening to this moduli space because we, we do hit this eigenvalue from time to time. Now, our proof, when we are assuming that there is an eigenfunction that's in the Friedrichs extension and in the holomorphic extension, is that uh, this Buckner's identity can hold for the holomorphic extension. So it turns out that uh, if I, this, this Buckner identity is hold, held pointwise, so I can still do this if I'm assuming that X is this gradient vector field generated by, this whole, by, by the eigenfunction. And uh, the question is whether I can do integration by part. Now, if, D, if U is in the holomorphic extension, the decay is just enough. So it might look weird because if you remember the definition of the holomorphic extension there, the expansion is actually more singular compared to the, the Friedrich extension because I don't not, not, I don't only, I'm not only having uh, bounded terms, I have unbounded terms actually. But the point is that if I'm doing this calculation here because by assuming it's in holomorphic extension, uh, those, all those singular terms will be killed by this operator already. So, the, and that's, and that is your only extension you can do this. So by this, we, we get enough decay to do the, um, to do the uh, integration by part, and this will generate a meromorphic vector field. So this shows that if an eigenfunction is, has eigenvalue two and in the holomorphic extension, then it is meromorphic. It generates a meromorphic vector field, which is not true in general for other, for other eigenfunctions. Then once you have this meromorphic eigenfunction, then the, a meromorphic vector field, you can generate back the, this uh, redeveloping map and generate back the, the reduced Roman monogamy. So that's uh, where the complex analysis part comes in, that uh, you, can, you can see that this vector field will give us a correct one form, and this can correctly generate a developing map. And here it involves some complex analysis. Basically, it boils down to say that if you have a holomorphic, a locally homomorphic function that is uh, positive everywhere, then there has to be a constant. Then, so, and, but here the idea is that we'll have to assume that uh, this eigenfunction itself is real valued. And that's where this uh, assumption of real valued or being in the joint uh, domain between the, the two extensions come away. And another thing I want to, uh, Mention here is that uh, there's also a dimension counting arg argument to tell us that uh, we can actually pick out the trivial monogamy. So the, the, uh, our theorem is that, so again, this is joined with being sure that uh, um, the dimension of such eigenfunctions in the joint domain is either one or three. And it's the dimension is three if and only if it's a branch cover. And that's where, and we know that where those, uh, those eigenfunctions come from. They come from the, the pull of, pullback of uh, uh, eigenfunctions from the sphere. Okay, 
So that's our theorem. So you can see that it's really relating the, um, the spectrum side and the geometry side. So we want to understand the reduced monogamy and that's why, that's why we got those results. Now, I want to mention a few questions. As I said, that a lot of things are still unknown and we really want to understand more of this. So the first type of question is that how do we detect the singularity of the moduli space? As I said, that we want to understand where are those points where those spherical conical metrics have two in the spectrum. So our theorem tells us that uh, if it's reducible, then certainly two is in the spectrum. As we, we saw, that, uh, that's the easy side. It just generates the eigenfunction itself. Now, the question is, it turns out that uh, there, are, um, there are implicit evidence that uh, there are irreducible spherical conical metrics. So those are very, uh, in some sense, more non-trivial spherical conical metrics that also have this property. And we are, it will be interesting to see how can we detect them directly, or if there's any way to see that, where do those, where do those, um, um, those, those metrics come from? Uh, so far, there are only ex implicit uh, arguments, so we don't know any implicit, uh, any constructions of such metrics. And the second type of question is, we want to understand the multiplicity of eigenvalue two here. As I mentioned earlier, that the multiplicity of the, eigens, of the eigenfunction tells us that uh, whether it's a point that's very rigid or partially rigid in the moduli space. So we want to care about the dimension counting here. And here, uh, even for branch covers, it turns out that it's not a trivial question that, uh, that I learned from, um, I learned that uh, this is that's, that's a result from Montiel and Ross saying that for branch covers, well, sometimes you, 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 can, you can tell whether it uh, has, has, has what, what kind of dimension you have for the Friedrich extension for eigenvalue two. And well, then the question is what happens for generic reducible metrics? That uh, if it's not a branch cover, if it's a, uh, um, say it's, if it's a, well, for a singular football, we know, for a simple football, we know because you can do separation variables. Now, if you have a glue football, suppose, suppose I have a heart or have a, uh, a bouquet of footballs, what's the, what's the dimension there? So those are questions I think you know, we, we still don't know what's the answer. And then, of course, there's a relation to the minimal immersions and extremal metrics. So that was, um, that was the talk last week. And uh, I should mention that there's uh, ongoing work with uh, Michelle Kapuyan that uh, we want to understand, we want to uh, build a connection between the reducible metrics and uh, the minimal immersions and see where we can detect those eigenfunctions. Okay, so that's uh, all I want to report today and thank you very much. All right. Uh, well, thank you uh, very much for uh, for this talk.